I'd like to um, present our featured speaker for this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know Vicki, uh, Vicki is going to present Basketry of Berks County. Um, Vicki is a lifelong resident uh, of Oley Township. She's an experienced basket weaver. She has a Master of Arts uh, degree in history and currently serves as education curator at the Berks History Center. So let's give Vicki a nice welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. And I would la rather have you studying this picture while I just talk for a couple of minutes because as far as I know, this is the only known picture of Reuben Ray Snyder's basket factory. Uh, certainly there are pictures of his home, uh, but this picture belongs to his granddaughter, Shirley Arnold, who I met uh, more than 20 years ago. And I will talk about the picture in a little bit, but I just want to thank you again for having me here tonight. Uh, Kelly introduced me as a lifelong resident of Oley Township. It's the Oley Valley. I spent my first 20 years growing up in Rockland Township, which I do consider the Oley Valley since it is the hills of the Oley Valley. And one of our five basket makers, Freddie and Annie Bieber, spent their life living in Rockland Township as well. My love of baskets began a little over 25 years ago. The summer of 1993 was a big summer for me. Uh, if you noticed, I was knitting earlier. That's the summer I learned how to knit. And for those of you who know me, you know I'm always knitting. And I also learned how to make a basket. And I also met my husband that summer while I was an intern at the Daniel Boone Homestead. And on Sunday afternoons, we would get into costume and do crafts. And towards the end of that summer, I had an opportunity to make my first basket, which is the one that you see here on the end. It was quite an ambitious project uh, for first basket. Also, the woman teaching us had not made very many baskets herself. So there's a few tricks that you do to make it easier, and we didn't know those tricks. So it was not a good experience. I wanted to light it on fire and just be rid of it, but today, of course, I'm very happy that I didn't do that. I will say that, that it's a large market basket. It took me about 10 hours. I can make one now in about two hours. So you get much better at it if you keep at it. Uh, what also happened that year is my husband is a graduate of Oli, and we would go deer spotting. And for those of you who are familiar with Rife Road, you know that even today it is still a dirt lane. And on that dirt lane is an overgrown apple orchard, which of course always has lots of deer. So that was a road that we would always deer spot on. I didn't know where I was because I wasn't familiar with the roads, but you also know that Rife goes from Old State to Basket. So that is where I first learned of Basket. I became intrigued. I wish I had taken a picture, but if you turn right from Rife onto Basket and you go a short distance, Ruben's house was located. And in the, in 1993, 1994, the foundation of the house, which is the one to your right, uh, was still standing. What I remember is it went up to kind of the windows. However, I didn't know what it was, so I didn't photograph it, but I'm glad that I had that memory. Now this picture really says a lot. Uh, Reuben is standing to the far right, and then his wife Esther, known as Hetty, has the small child in front of her, and she has in front of her is Esther, who was born in 1896. So my guess is this picture then was taken around 1897 or 1898. Also pictured are Eamon. He is the boy on the porch behind, or excuse me, he's to the left, or it's over, I'm having my directions wrong, to the right a little bit. Uh, the two older daughters are there, uh, Maggie Mae and Lily. And the small children are Caroline and Charles. The two younger children, David and Emily, are not born yet. 
But what you see on this picture, the house is the smaller one and the factory is the large structure. You would think that Hetty would have insisted on a bigger house with what would become eight children. Um, the factory, in talking with Shirley Arnold, who is the granddaughter again, she said that her mother said that by about 1920, the factory was no longer standing. My thought is it's a frame building. It probably fell into disrepair or, or for whatever reason and was no longer existing past the 20s. The house, though, is in pretty good shape. I'm going to show you a later picture taken in the 50s. And then I will uh, just add that um, Mike Henney, you probably know the landscaper in the area. He always does such a nice job down at the post office. Uh, he contacted me, and in 1980, he was living, renting a house down the road a little bit, and he told me he went into Reuben's house around 1980. The roof was gone. Rain was coming in, that sort of stuff, but he found a wash basket. And he was interested in donating it to uh, Burke's History Center, but given its condition, they declined it. So he said he was going to sell it on eBay, and I said, well, would you sell it to me? And I am a good Pennsylvania Dutch woman. I love this. He said to me, make me a wash basket I can use, and I will give it to you. So, I do have a Reuben Ray Snyder basket. It's in very poor condition. I don't move it. Um, every few days I could pick up a piece that's fallen off of it. But, uh, so in 1980 the structure was, you know, mostly there and then by the late 1990s was when a development went in. If you see though, if you look at the picture, uh, a basket got its name in 1883, Reuben Rafe Snyder was asked to be the first, first, po first and only postmaster. I think by about 1903 is when it closed. Uh, in front of the house, there is a big stone that is still there today. It's alongside the road. And he picked the name Big Stone. But who knew? Somewhere else in Pennsylvania was a Big Stone post office. So that is when he chose the name Basket. I would also like to add that the other gentleman in the picture are most likely the workers he employed. He employed as many as eight basket weavers in his factory, usually about five. And what makes this so unusual is there were other basket making factories, but they were in cities like Philadelphia, Erie, Liverpool, New York was another uh, big basket making place. But this was really out in the middle of nowhere. It's still kind of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Most people don't know where it is. Also note the willow that Reuben would be using. Reuben most likely, I know that um, his cousin Milt Laurel, who also wove in basket, I met with his granddaughter Marion, and she said that his willow fields were along the Little Manitani, which is down on Link Road. So my guess would be that is also where Reuben had his. This was an article written in 1954 uh, in the Reading newspaper. Uh, this shows you Milt Laurel. Again, he is Reuben Rafe Snyder's second cousin, I believe, given the age difference, and his wife Mimi in their general store located in Basket. But you can see that Reuben's house was still in very good condition in 1954. This is what it looks like today. You can see that the big stone is still there. And then of course we now have Paradise Court. I would like, oop, did I skip one? Yep, I did. From the Rafe Snyder family Bible that uh, Shirley Arnold shared with me, it's written, Reuben Rafe Snyder, a son of John Rafe Snyder and wife of Maria, a daughter of George Laurel, was born June 16, 1841 in Ruska Manor Township, Berks County, and baptized October 17, 1841 by Reverend Herman, sponsors Jacob Rafe Snyder and Catherine Laurel. 
and was also confirmed 1859 by Reverend Herman at the Spies Church Lutheran Reformed. Reuben Rafe Snyder was a private of Captain William Gunther, Company G, 198 Regiment of Pennsylvania Volunteers, was enrolled August 30th, 1864, served one year during the war, and was discharged from service of the United States July 20th, 1865, at the United States General Hospital, Chester, PA, by reason of a wound received at Southside Railroad, March 25th, 1865. The captain and soldier's comrades did say, we respect our fellow Reuben on account of his very good humor. Reuben Rafe Snyder, when he was wounded, would end up having his left leg amputated, then return to his farm and basket, most likely not knowing how he was gonna farm, and decided to become a basket weaver. When I was a famous lady, for the famous ladies' tea for the, D, the Daughters of the American Revolution, I invented the story. You really wonder how Reuben learned how to make willow baskets because they are very difficult. I have only made one and it's very basic. And there's just techniques and, and things you need to be taught in order to make beauti beautiful baskets. I invented the story that Reuben learned from one of those passing gypsies through the Oli Valley, and uh, they were documented. Uh, they were, I had been told in the, even the early 1900s, they would camp where Swavely's garage is now, and so I believe that's how he learned how to make baskets. I have another theory that'll come a little bit later, though. So. Esther, known as Hetty, nine, was born March 13, 1865, but at the time of, in Kumru, but in the time of her marriage lived in Oli Township. I had also, I thought she was born in Kumru, and I thought, gosh, how did they meet? But uh, in meeting with Shirley again, I learned that she was living in Oli Township, and for those of you who are very familiar with the area, you know that Ruska Manor, Alsis, and Oli pretty much tee up at each other right where Reuben was living. So probably she lived nearby. I don't know if you noticed, noted the age difference of 25 years. Most likely Reuben did not think he would outlive his wife, but he did. Their children, and I am so thankful again to Shirley, uh, she, I was introduced to Shirley through her brother Gerald uh, Great Bowder, Gerald was a volunteer at the Daniel Boone Homestead and I was making a basket and he introduced himself to me and said he was Reuben Rafe Snyder's grandson. Now at the time, I knew he was, Reuben was a veteran, a Civil War veteran, and I thought how can a grandson of Reuben Rafe Snyder be living? So I thought he was cuckoo, but anyway. He introduced me to Shirley, who's the family historian, and Reuben would have his eighth child at the age of 65. So that is how there are grandchildren living today. But in this photograph, the eighth child is not born yet. And given the age of David, David is the youngest here and he was born in 1900. Shirley and I have dated this photograph to probably around 1904 or 1905. So we have Eamon, who I met a gentleman tonight who told me where Eamon's farm was. It's the old Bortz farm, or it's not the old, the Bortz lived there on uh, Bull Road. But he was born June 30th, 1883. Maggie May, we're guessing, is the taller of the two, since she's only a year older than Lily. Maggie was born in March, 1886. Lily, October 13th, 1887. Caroline, December 5th, 1889. Charles Aaron, June 24th, 1894. Esther, April 6th, 1896. She would then marry John Klein, another of the Berks County, the Oli Valley basket weavers. And then we have David, born February 26, 1900. Emily was born December 23, 1907. 
and Esther would then pass away from complications of that childbirth on January 10th, 1908. So, Although this is not the best picture, it's a, one of the very few like original photographs, we have Reuben in the center. This picture is dated 1893. I think it might be a little bit later given his age because that would make him 50 years old and he looks a little bit older than 50 to me. But the gentleman next to him is George Chrisman who is also weaving a basket and he looks older so I wonder if George taught him but there's nothing known about George he's not mentioned in um, uh, this book here Jeanette Lazansky's Willow Oak and Rye who lists all the, the basket weavers of Pennsylvania actually the young gentleman next to him is his cousin Milt Laurel and then his oldest son Eamon is pictured in the back. So, Hetty again passes away in 1908. Reuben would pass away a little over a year later in March of 1909. He was 67 years old. He is buried at Spee's Church and then this is a close-up and I would like to read his obituary to you, again provided by, by Shirley. Reuben Ray Snyder served as a postmaster at Basket and was well known as a basket maker. Reuben Ray Snyder, who for many years manufactured baskets and after whose establishment the post office was named, died of paralysis at his home at Basket in Rusca Manor Township, Thursday evening, March 25th, 1909. He was aged 67 years, 9 months, and 7 days. He was well known in this city and furnished many thousands of baskets for, largest, for the largest dealers in that line in Reading and vicinity. He was the first postmaster and held the position until the office closed. Reuben Rafe Snyder, who was a veteran of the Civil War, had an excellent record. He enlisted August 25, 1864, and was mustered into service at Philadelphia as a private to serve one year in Company G, 198th Regiment, Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, under Captain William Gunther and Colonel H.J. Sickles. The regiment was assigned to the 1st Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps Army of the Potomac, and Comrade Rice Snyder shared the fortune of the regiment in the following engagements. This is for the Civil War buffs in here. PB Farm, September 30th, 1864. Raid on Southside Railroad, October 27th, 1864. Weldon's Railroad, December 6th, 1864. Hatcher's Run, or Lewis Farm, March 29th, 1865, where he was wounded by gunshot in the left thigh and taken to the hospital at Washington, D.C. After seven weeks, he was taken to Chester Hospital where the leg was amputated. At the close of the war, he was honorably discharged. Shirley added a note here that the leg was amputated on the battlefield and not in the hospital. Deceased is survived by eight children, Aaron, Esther, Arthur, and Emily at home. Eamon Ruska Manor, Maggie, wife of Harvey Bollinger Ruska Manor, Lily, wife of Aaron Rife Ruska Manor, Carrie, wife of David Bauer, Alsis, which I just learned where Carrie lived at the Bauer Farm on Basket Road. It's interesting that Lily married a Rife. I see Mr. Watts here, and he lives at the Rife Farmstead. And I should also note that Lily would end up raising Emily. And Lily had a daughter only three weeks older than Emily, and they were very much raised as sisters. In fact, Shirley said she, that she was never Aunt Lily. And this is my good friend, Shirley Arnold. You can tell she doesn't like her picture taken because she wouldn't look at the camera. 
and she has in front of her the two baskets on the floor are baskets made by John Klein, her uncle. He would one of those baskets was a wedding present to Shirley. Uh, on the table, the basket to the right, the cutie, the very beautiful basket is a Reuben Rafe Snyder basket. I do have a close-up of that. This is the only basket that Shirley has that her grandfather made. I think Reuben's baskets, given the age of them, are more difficult to identify as actual Reuben baskets. So that makes this one extra special. She said that her mother had it in a pillowcase in the attic, and when she passed away, she found this gorgeous picnic basket, or, or lunch basket is what it is. And because it was never used, it was in, it's in very good condition. So now we're going to move on. I call this my cutie pie, Milt Laurel. How do you like that, Marion? <laughs> Your grandfather. He's kite, the very dashing young man. Milt Laurel was born in 1879 and died at the year uh, at 80 years of age in 1859. This is a wonderful picture. It is from the Echoes of Scalia book. And you can see Reuben or excuse me, Milt Laurel, the tall gentleman in the background. Uh, possibly Marion could identify some of the people in the picture, but I would like to read to you uh, what was written in that book. Listed among the abandoned post offices of Berks County is the Hamlet of Basket. Before the days of the establishment of rural free delivery, this hamlet on the border of Alsis and Ruska Manor townships was an important spot on Uncle Sam's map. Now the community is served by a rural carrier. The township line separates Alsace and Ruska Manor, passes through the property of Milt Laurel, a veteran basket maker of basket. The Oli township line is less than 100 yards to the east of Laurel property. There are many examples of towns that have given their names to the product manufactured there. For example, we have Cordova leather, Sheffield silverware, and many others, but one searches a long time to find the reverse situation, that of an industry giving its name to the place, as basket weaving provided the name for the Burks Village. It has some other information, but what I found interesting is when I met with Marion a couple of weeks ago, she was telling me how her grandfather was having a hard time finding good willow to weave with, and written in here says a, a destructive, and I might add this was written in 1945, a destructive insect has presented a serious threat to willow basket weaving industry in recent years. This insect stings the tender branches of the willow tree leaving a long black streak which mars the appearance of the whitish fibers and weakens their texture. Some willow trees can be found occasionally that are still insect free and Laurel is continually searching for unspoiled willow whips. The Berks History Center had an exhibit about 15 years ago called Basketry a Useful Art. And these photographs, I apologize, I don't know who they belong to, but they are pictures of Milt and his wife Mimi and what it looked like. And then this is what it looks like today. This is the old general store. It is owned by Bobby Knoll, uh, who I met with also. And he told me, I asked Marion, and um, in the 60s when the house was sold, the Knolls who owned the adjacent farm were the next owners. There were no in-between in owners. But when I talked to Bobby Knoll, he told me when he moved in there, they unfortunately ripped out all of the general store stuff. But fortunately, it's in the basement of his mother's farmhouse next door. So if the Oli Valley Heritage Association ever gets a museum space, you might want to contact Bobby Knoll. The next door stone house uh, is also owned by Bobby Knoll. His son lives there, uh, was the home that Milton and Mimi lived in. And years ago, I, I was given this really cool picture 
by a relative of what this home looked like, I think probably around 1900. I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, but um, you can see what it looks like today. It's a gorgeous home. And I love this picture of Milt. My guess is that Milt was working for Reuben at this time. Uh, he was Reuben's apprentice. That is a lot of weaving. And uh, given the age of him in this picture too, my guess is it's probably the eight, late 1800s, very early 1900s, and it's an undated photo. But he is making a delivery to the many stores in Reading, probably Stickter's Hardware and other places. This is my good friend Marion, who's here tonight. Marion Laurel Swizek has this gorgeous wash basket. And when we had the exhibit at the Burke's History Center, what I learned was what makes what what helps you identify a milk laurel basket is the feet that he put on. Usually basket weavers of old had styles or techniques that they did continuously because they didn't sign their baskets, unfortunately. So Milt Laurel put these feet on. Marion called me a couple of weeks later. She has another basket in her home that she didn't think was made by her grandfather, but she discovered it had feet on it. And she said, I bet you my grandfather made that picture or made that basket. This large wash basket, is that the one that's on the table? Okay. Uh, Lori, Marion's uh, daughter, has a wash basket, and you can see the feet, and it's sitting on the bench. I wish I had, I needed to transfer more photos, Lori. I apologize. I should have a picture of the whole bench, but I do have a picture of these holes, which Marion is not really sure what they were for. It's, it's not. I think something took part when the wills were peeled. I think as they peeled the wills, they stuck them in the stroll. Probably, yes. And I'll just go back so you can see these pictures here and really how beautifully made. Uh, when I contacted Marion, uh, her name, I know her son Clay, but I forgot he told me that Milt Laurel was his grandfather. I should have remembered that, of course. She had this in her attic, and the story was it needed repair. So your grand or your dad repaired it. Okay, your dad repaired it, and then he told her, put it in the attic and don't touch it. <laughs> now my thought is, if it sits in an attic, nobody sees it. And then your kids don't know the importance your grandkids and so I've encouraged her to keep it out just don't put it in sunlight keep it out of the sunlight it's in the living room with you. good I'm going to visit it someday <laughs> again <laughs> all right so Milt Laurel Mary uh, she gave me great directions he is also buried at Spee's Church not too far from Reuben and you can see that he passed away in 1959 and then maybe would live until 1982. I don't have very much information on John Klein. Uh, John Klein I had thought was an apprentice of Reuben, not really thinking, but he is an apprentice of Milt Laurel. The age doesn't match up. So he lived in Oli. Uh, this is, I took a close-up of the bottle basket that Shirley Arnold owns, and it's really pretty. It's a miniature. I've never seen a miniature now that I think about it. John Klein is buried at Frieden's Church uh, on Main Street, and you can see that his years are 1869, or 1896 to 1972. His home stood next to the church. And when I first moved to Oli a little over 20 years ago, I remember the house being torn down to make the parking lot bigger. So again, that's something else I wished I had photographed. John Klein uh, would demonstrate at the Pennsylvania German uh, Folk Festival, but he was not a full-time weaver. I should point out that only Reuben so far is classified a full-time weaver by Jeanette Lazansky, most likely because Milt had the general store. So I would like to just also mention Vivian Aaron. 
because she is a basket weaver living on Basket Road. However, I bumped into her walking about a year and a half ago and I had asked her, she's no longer weaving baskets, uh, but she's a talented weaver. She uh, was a guild member. Uh, and again, she lives on Basket Road. And uh, according to the article here, uh, she was taught by a German, a second generation German basket weaver in the 60s which is a goal of mine someday. I would like to write an art grant and receive it so that I can study under a willow basket weaver to learn how to do it because that's the only way I'm gonna learn how to do it. This is my good friend Elaine who's here tonight. Elaine owns Vivian Aaron's very first basket that she made. So I would have to say that she was an artist even then because that is a beautiful first willow basket. So we do have pictured here, uh, we have milk laurel down at the bottom. This is something that Dick Shaner had done. Uh, we have Freddie Beaver and then up the top is Ollie Strouser. I'm going to move on to him. In Jeanette's book, I love this quote, this Ollie Strouser said, I got the notion from Reuben Ray Snyder in a basket shop near Friedensburg. He said it would take three years to learn the trade, same as the rest he taught. But I answered back, heck, knocky mole, and learned in three weeks. I had watched him many a time, so it wasn't that hard. <laughs> so, oh, let me go back. You can see here the different steps uh, to uh, making the baskets. I love the picture of the tool. In an article in the Historical Review of Berks County, which I have free copies back there, and please take them because I don't want to take anything back. Uh, also, there's membership information to the Berks History Center if you're interested. But in a 1950 article by Aline Sager, Deccan or Jashant, depending on how you say it, I was uh, introduced to her by uh, Shirley Arnold. Apparently she wrote a book like Travels Through the Oli Valley, but Shirley wasn't able to locate the book for me. Uh, and then I was intrigued to see that she wrote this article. And she described, or Ollie describes the willow harvesting process. When we reached the willow patch, he explained, I cut my willows with pruning shears in February when it gives nice weather and before the sap runs while they are dormant, then I stand them in water in a pool down the hill yonder between crisscross rails. If I didn't separate them like that, it would easy give combustion. I leave them there for several months, sometimes as late as May, until they sprout. It sure is a pretty sight when they when that sprouting comes. The, the day must be warm when I strip the willows, he continued, sunny too to bleach them. The tool I use I made from an iron prong. There is a knack to it, of course, but once you learn a thing, you don't easy forget. You cut off the sprouts just according to how they hang fast, how you find them. After I strip them and dry them, I put them in bundles, 120 each. Then whenever I want to make a basket, all I need to do is put some in water overnight. I have only enough to last me a month, about 1,300 pounds. Should have a ton. Only I have no time to tend them and it takes a lot of work. About a week to cut and three weeks to strip. Ollie Strouser, you know, it's a beautiful day, no clouds. Not the best picture but how many cloudless days have we had recently? So Ollie Strouser lives in one of the tenant homes of the Oli Furnace, and it's located on Spook Lane. And what I love in this article, I should add that one of my docents, uh, Dee Dee Mayer, lived in this home a few years ago, so I did have an opportunity to get inside the house. Dee Dee was very proud, and again, you can't see it very well, but it was a sunny day, uh, the beautiful gazebo that Ollie built. And in this article it says, 
Pennsylvania Dutch Ollie takes pride also in a pavilion artistically constructed of natural cedar. Made it myself, he explained. That's genuine tile on the roof, old fashioned tile. He pried one loose and pointed out the grooves. Though you can see the sky through the cracks when you stand under the roof, rain won't come through. It goes down these grooves. He also showed me one that had a name across the base. Now, of course, I think he was talking about red tiles, and as you can see, it no longer has its red tiles, but at least it's still there. This is my good friend Elaine, who also has Air, uh, Vivian Aaron's first basket, but she has two beautiful Ollie Strouser baskets. How lucky for me that Elaine would bring her first, fourth grade students to the Berks History Center to do tours. And then as soon as she retired, she started doing tours for me. She is probably my docent that needed no training because she had been on tour so often. Uh, the basket to the left is on the table there. Uh, she had been given that basket by Lillian Walters and has graciously gifted it to me recently, so I own an Ollie Strouser basket. She also has at the end the milk jug basket, which Ollie was most known for the milk jar basket. He also made wash, egg, and market. And he says, uh, sometimes folks want me to use colored strips, but I don't like them. They fade like anything. And with the white ones, you can wash. It takes me two or three hours anyway to make a milk basket. And in that time, I can make a wash basket too. Now, just like Milt Laurel, what helps identify Ollie Strouser's basket is he puts an extra band on the bottom to protect the bottom so it would last longer. And I just want to add, orders for two years back, he will tell you, from Philadelphia, St. Louis, and all over. The hardware stores are after me too for wash baskets. Orders for two years back. My guess is it was so labor intensive and not, I guess he should have just charged more for his baskets and done it more often, but to have orders two years back is pretty incredible. Now we're going to move on to Freddie Beaver. Uh, Dick Shaner and Eleanor are here tonight. I met with them a few weeks ago and uh, I had a copy of this article but it wasn't a very good copy so I was able to make a better copy. You can see Freddie on the back. I think you can also see the family resemblance. Uh, Freddie Beaver is Dick Shaner's great uncle. He was his grandmother's uh, brother. So, in Dick Shaner's article, it said, since the early part of the century, with the advancement of agricultural automation, Fred could not compete on the market with the, with the small crops he and his horses were able to raise. Realizing that his farmland was too hilly for modern tractor at the time, he let his farm fields grow back into forests, with the exception of a few acres of tilled land. Fred did not actively farm the 80-acre farm and was dependent on the basket trade. Freddie Beaver would be taught by his neighbor, Jonas Day. It's interesting to learn in that article when I reread it that Jonas was a willow basket weaver. Did you know that, Dick? He was a willow basket weaver. So my thought is Freddie taught himself how to make white oak baskets because Jonas was making willow and it's totally different. Freddie wrote, Freddie wrote woven oak and willow, but willow took more time than Freddie had patience for. That's what was written in the article. He is at a schnitzel bunk that you can see here. Now, when I, I read to you the willow preparation, you got just a little tired. Wait till you hear how to prepare the oak splints. Written here it says, although most of Fred's land is wooded, 
He finds it difficult to get enough white oak trees suitable for basket making. There is indeed a great quantity of oak trees in Bieber's Loch, but not many meet the standards of this basket maker. Fred uses only white oak for baskets and accepts no substitute. The white oak tree is chosen because of its quality of splitting and its durability. In recent years, it has become necessary for him to travel as far as two or three miles on foot to find good oak trees. Not just any oak, white oak tree possesses the proper qualities for the basket maker, and therefore certain judgment must be exercised in selecting them. First of all, the tree must be young and not over about 10 inches in diameter. Ideally, it should grow straight and not have any limbs for the first, or ten of, first 10 or 15 feet of trunk. If there are limbs or were limbs, the knots made by them in the wood will prevent proper splitting and cause a waste of wood. After a tree has become found and is chipped with an ax to check the grain of the wood, this second requirement is the most important. If the circles show on the chip are too far or too close to each other, the oak wool, wood will not split for the proper thickness of the baskets. Freddie has found that oak trees which thrive in the swamps are the most difficult to meet this requirement. Though his years of experience, Fred has developed an ability to walk through the forests of Berks and pick by sight the trees which will be good for baskets. Provided a tree has been found, he will measure it according to its size baskets he anticipates to make. Bushel baskets, of course, demand that the initial logs be cut about six foot lengths and smaller baskets at smaller lengths. When the tree is felled, he will measure the logs to be cut with his ax handle and hands. So accustomed is Fred to measuring with his hands and fingers that he never takes a foot ruler into the forest. All the measurements for the logs and the baskets are so much a part of his memory that he is seldom, if ever, wrong. If a tree will not yield a certain number of logs, Fred will not suffer it to the axe. When the cutting of the tree has been completed, the logs will be loaded on a wooden wheelbarrow and taken home. In places where there are no paths through the forest, Fred will sometimes walk blocks with an oak log on his back. When Fred arrives home with the cut logs, he stores them in the spring cellar of his home so that he will not dry out too quickly. Should the green wood dry out, it will be extremely difficult to work with and much will be wasted. For this reason, the basket weaver cannot make, cannot keep large supply of logs on hand. Aren't you exhausted? <laughs> I might add, I buy my supplies. <laughs> Not that I wouldn't make a white oak basket. Uh, there are places that you can go and you spend a week or your two weeks and you do the whole process. That is my dream vacation, probably not yours, but I will do that someday. Uh, I consider myself a basket weaver in the oak tradition because I am using commercial basket weave uh, that you buy. When I started weaving 25 years ago, a pound of reed costs four dollars. Today it costs about thirteen dollars. It's still an inexpensive craft. This particular pound is flat, one inch flat oval. Uh, you can buy, or excuse me, one inch flat reed. Uh, there's flat oval, there's round reed, and it's all classified and used. But again, I go on the computer and I order it. Freddie could not do that. I should add that um, if you're interested in basket weaving, the country seat is located in Kempton. Uh, it is a family owned business of about 40 years. I had always bought my supplies there, but as my life got busier, even though I enjoyed the ride there, it was two or three hours of my time and it just became easier to order online. So that's how I mostly uh, order my baskets. You can see here, this is called a Breckstuck. And he is pulling through, he's, what he's doing is he's making 
his weavers. He's cutting it with the maul. He's using an axe. He's using this, it's called again a breakstuck. It says it takes two to three sittings to prepare the materials. The splints or the weavers are um, usually a, a piece of leather is over your knee and you'll rub it on that to make it smooth. And then you can see he's splitting the weavers here and then finally weaving the basket. I do believe that oak is more durable. Uh, it seems to me, given a hundred years, that willow just is more brittle than oak, so your oak baskets over time are more, um, last longer, can have harder use. I should also note that Annie Beaver, Freddie's wife, and I have a picture of her there to the right, Annie Beaver, Freddie's wife, was a talented weaver. In the fall and winter months, Annie did a great deal of the weaving with Freddie, splitting the material. They had as many as, diff as many as 50 different sizes. Eight quart baskets cost about a dollar. Uh, Freddie and Annie Bieber are listed in Jeanette Lazansky's book as full-time weavers. When Annie was living, they stored their baskets in the attic of their home and people could come there and purchase the baskets. Uh, but they also went to what were called vendus, the most popular at the Fredericksville Hotel. And Ascension Day was the biggest selling day for Freddie and Annie. Uh, there, it, there were several hundred people that attended this, ben, this Ascension Day vendu at the Fredericksville Hotel. They had to uh, travel two miles carrying their baskets in a wheelbarrow, carting it, and it says in the article their big treat was cones of ice cream. <laughs> now I do want to just point out the picture of Freddie and Annie too. Well, I'm getting myself on that side. Uh, the, uh, the house here I've been very intrigued with. I've, I've spoken with Eleanor and Dick about it. Uh, Dick Levingood was a former trustee of the Burke's History Center and he did a program more than 20 years ago and one of his topics was Freddie Beaver's house that he had bought and restored. So I always thought it was this home that is located on Rupert Schoolhouse Road. But a few years ago I talked to Eleanor and she said no, it's not along the road, you have to drive back a lane. So Rippert Schoolhouse Road uh, tees into uh, Day Road, and at the end of Day Road is another old house, which I thought was Freddie Beaver's house, but it's not, because it doesn't match the previous photograph, and that was most likely Jonas Day's home, the man who taught Freddie Beaver. So then I got very excited because my husband's friend, Nate Christman, bought a house on Rupert Schoolhouse down the lane. Now how coincidental would that be? So I took pictures, but they do not match. And what Nate told me is he did purchase his house from Dick Levingood, but Dick Levingood also owns an adjacent house that must be Freddie Beaver's house. So I don't have a photograph of it because I thought I had it <laughs> up until this past Sunday. I was studying it and talking with my husband and Nate and I've also been told that uh, Dick Levengood, I do know, lives in Lancaster County and he has problems with trespassing. So I'm going to ask you, Eleanor, to go with me one time. We talked about doing this and we'll trespass together, but I'll get permission first. I'm going well, you know what, I thought, in my opinion, you can, in the name of history, you can always trespass once. But if he's having problems with trespassers, we could get arrested, but I will get permission first to go back there. And here we have our good friends, Eleanor and Dick, who have a beautiful collection of Freddie Beaver baskets, and I should also add that Brian Hart, you'll see up here, has brought his collection of Freddie Beaver baskets. What helps you identify a Freddie Beaver basket is the way that he does, um, it's not called a God's Eye. When I make a basket like this, it's a God's Eye. This is a different way of starting your basket. Uh, he also nails, oop, 
Oh, do I not have a picture? I don't have a picture of the bottom, I apologize. It's so good that Brian bought his. Uh, Freddie Bieber puts runners on the bottom of his baskets, very much like Ollie Strouser, to give it more strength. And runners can get replaced if they get wore out or broken. Also, Freddie Bieber, uh, most popular was the red. Uh, Brian has a blue one, and he says it's a little unusual. Dick told me he has an aqua one in his collection, and Brian says he has a purple one. His mother owns a purple one, so that would be very colorful. Uh, I dye my basket, Reed. Um, Freddie painted his. I had asked Dick. I was kind of curious. It didn't look dyed, so he would paint the strips. When I dye my basket, Reed, there is commercial basket dye that I can get. However, it doesn't work as good as RIT. So I use clothing dye when I dye my baskets. Freddie Bieber and Annie are, are buried at the New Jerusalem Hotel. When I was making preparation for this presentation, my great-grandparents knew Freddie and Annie Bieber. They were about the same age and lived about a mile apart. My grandmother never talked about Freddie, but she did talk about Annie. But what my dad says, and this makes me very sad, my great-grandparents had baskets that were most definitely named, made by Freddie and Annie Beaver. And unfortunately, the farmhouse burnt when my dad was eight years old. So all those baskets disappeared. Otherwise, I might own one, and hopefully I will someday. But he is buried in the same cemetery that most of my grandmother's side of the family is buried. And you can see here that his dates are 1885 to 1978. And then you can see that Annie was a bit older than Freddie and would pass away then a little bit earlier than him. I did want to just talk a little bit about um, the three types of baskets made in uh, this area are willow, oak, and rye. Uh, most rye baskets were used for food reasons. Uh, these are bread rising baskets. Uh, this is a woman demonstrating at the Ephrata Cloister, and I love to include this picture because if you go to Ephrata, uh, one of the women living there, she was still living there, was weaving the most ginormous rye straw basket that I've ever seen. Now the funny story is, she wove it too big and could never get it through the doorway out of the room. <laughs> so it's still there today, you can go see it today. Bee skeps were another popular rye straw basket. The um, apple schnitz or the apple drying baskets are made out of rye. They're almost exclusive to southeastern Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania Germans are smart. Rye, the smell of rye, repels rodents. Mice and rats and squirrels do not like the smell of rye straw, so they will stay away from it, which is why you have food storage baskets, the apple drying baskets. I have uh, worked in rye. It's not a basket I like to make. It's a coil technique. So you're like sewing your basket together and it's boring and tedious. <laughs> I did make a bee skep. It took me about 30 hours. I will never make another one. Uh, and I have a problem getting rye straw. I had a, a connection there for a while. Uh, I do know Jim Lures. He was the director at the Landis Valley Museum. He grows rye straw there. I pretty much begged, but I never got any rye straw, which is okay. I would like to teach classes. They're, my sort of niche with basket weaving is I have been teaching classes almost from the start. I stopped counting Girl Scouts when I hit 800. I'm well over 1,000. Adult-wise, I've taught a couple of thousand people. My oldest was 96, a gentleman in an assisted living facility, and my youngest was my son, Devin, who's was three, he's now 16. This is Jeanette Lazansky's book, which I have a copy of that you can look at. Talks about the, the traditions, the construction, 
Uh, she's got many photographs, and then in the back, I love it, she lists all the basket weavers in Pennsylvania. So it's a very complete book. I had to make this my last picture. Now this picture I love. It was taken by George Miser. And I was reading about how this poor man could not afford a horse. He had to use a wheelbarrow. But how did Freddie Bieber end up with a motorcycle later in life <laughs> to sell his baskets? I have to talk with Dick about that because that is a great photograph. It was probably taken, I think, in a better photograph. Stephanie, you can see your mill in the background. It was taken right by the, where the Kindigs live. So I did want to just tell you a little bit about the baskets here. Uh, I do traditional basket weaving, but I think what makes me a little bit different is I like to put history in my baskets. So, one of the things that I like to do, my dad makes these bases for me. I asked him to make me about a dozen and he showed up with a hundred. And I was like, Dad. And he said, well, you got to use up the whole piece of wood, right? But what I did here is my son Devin wanted to make a Christmas basket, so while he was making it, I took pictures, and then I decoupaged them on the bottom. And given that we cannot always identify basket weavers today, he signed the bottom and dated it. He was about six when he made this. And this is probably my all-time favorite basket. My daughter... I put her prints here, and then her prints here, and I sometimes get emotional, so if I do, she's now 18. Made for Becca's sixth birthday by Mama and Becca Hefner, 2006. Becca loves the color purple, grapes, pancakes for breakfast, macaronis with no cheese. She will still not eat macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Putting makeup on Devin, he doesn't let her do that anymore. <laughs> Folding wash with Mama and Huggies. So, hopefully she will have this for the rest of her life. Are there any questions? I didn't. Yes, Elaine. I'd like to say, Vicki did the most beautiful baskets for me. Yeah. My husband was a deer hunter, and I had this vision of using the antlers as part of baskets. And so she made four baskets, one for each of my girls mm -hmm. and one for me. And they are so beautiful. So she does personalize things mm -hmm. very well. Oh, thank you. I loved how, Elaine, um, after your husband passed away, you had a lot of these antlers, and you were trying to figure out what to do with them and how to really create a memory with them. That's what, what we did. I didn't expect to talk so long. I apologize, but I have one question in the back. Not a question, but a statement. I knew John Klein, and John Klein was a character. <laughs> and in one of his sittings at the Kutztown Folk Festival, the governor came, and the governor wanted to buy one of his baskets. I don't know what John got for his baskets at that time, but the governor gave him a $50 bill. And John says, I don't have change for that. He says, you go over there to the food stand and get change there. He said, he said that guy called, I'd give it to him for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and can you tell me, I wanted to call Shirley today, do you know what John Klein did for a living? Because he was not a full-time basket weaver. No, but John Klein would go dig herbs and roots and sell them for pharmaceutical supplies. His brother-in-law was Arthur Rafe Snyder. And John owned a small lot next to Arthur. And the two of them would argue constantly. You'd see them out there with shovels and picks looking for land markers and, and survey markers and John had a an old trailer in the back there and that's where he kept his willows. And Arthur also lived on Main Street, correct? Yes. Uh, Shirley lived across the street from Esther and John and then Arthur lived 
going towards breezy corners, I believe. I have to tell you the story about Shirley Arner. Well, I have so, has so much fun. She was describing to me where Lily lived. Now, Lily, again, remember, raised her mother, Emily. And uh, she's talking about this lane from the main street and the new road. It crosses the new road. And I, I'm, I walk a lot. I, I know the area. You're, you can see a lot more when you walk. And I said, finally to her, I said, what new road are you talking about? Route 73. <laughs> and it's not that new. Now, if you know where Brendan Fields lives, that was where her Aunt Lily lived. So um, I should also add that I live on Basket Road. My husband and I lived on Old State Road for 14 years. And we saved up, and my husband's dream was always to have land of his own to hunt on with his children. So we saved, and we were finally able to purchase 12 acres. And I have a beautiful new home. However, my husband rolls his eyes when I see this. But what I like most about my new house is its address. I live at 482 Basket Road, just a little bit down the road from where Reuben and Milt Laurel made their baskets. So thank you very much. Please come up and look at the beautiful baskets and I'm here for any additional questions. Mm -hmm.